that is our staff. For those of you who don't know me, I am Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center. And I on Africa is our victory seminar series. And today we are very honored to have a very distinguished guest speaker for Africa. And I'm going to let our interim director, Dr. Lewaziru, introduce him. So uh, thank you very much, Aula. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us to spend your lunch break with us. And so we look forward to the talk. We are really excited to have uh, our Professor Asante with us. Uh, just introducing him would be, would be a talk on itself, but he has done a good job himself because he wrote a, a memoir as I ran towards Africa. So I'll let you go and look through that for yourself. I'll just point out some highlights about his very illustrious life. So uh, Professor uh, Molefi Asante is a professor in the Department of Africology. So this is uh, at Temple University in Philadelphia. And he's also president of the Molefi uh, Asante Institute of Afrocentric Studies that's set up out there in, in Philadelphia. So, and again, he has, Nations with Africa are going many, many years, so many countries uh, lived in Zimbabwe, around Biria, and all sorts of places. And then he's also Professor Extraordinarius at the University of South Africa. A little Latin helps, right? <laughs> you have to pronounce the Latin. <laughs> okay. And then, so he's also uh, the founding editor of the Journal of Black Studies and also first director for the UCLA Center for Afro-American Studies. So it's really you know, right there in terms of uh, the theory and like uh, one of the founding members of the idea of Afrocentrism. And then in terms of books, lots of books, more than a hundred books right, that he has written, very prolific. But just some of them uh, being human, uh, being human being. So transforming the race and, and discourse. You have books like uh, the Precious Center, Radical Insurgencies, the History of Africa. You know, uh, an Afro, uh, an Afrocentric uh, Pan-Africanist vision. So among many books, uh, also history globally, a global history. That's writing about that, erasing racism, uh, the survival of the American nation. So straddling the both continents, Africa, the US, and around the world. And the uh, African-American history, a journey of liberation uh, facing South Africa, and uh, even writing about some, some of our own important uh, people on the African continent, uh, Maulana, Karenga, and intellectual poetry. So in terms of publications, more than 500 publications extremely uh, prolific. And so, and then people refer to him as one of the most distinguished thinkers on the African, in the African world, right? And one of the most uh, considered, one of the most quoted living African authors. So there's the, so the accolades go on and go on. And also uh, he is NCS or this communication association named him uh, distinguished scholar there. And in terms of his, a little bit about his educational background, so PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles. So it's some of the, the fastest PhD programs. So he got his PhD at the age of 26. And by then he was a full professor. Four oh, years, right? <laughs> so, so, so that's a very impressive at the, at the University of New York and Buffalo. So, and again, at Temple, he also created a PhD program in African American studies. Again, so, so really, uh, uh, and then I'm just winding down because I can go on and on. And uh, so, Lots of work on outreach as well. So doing some work in uh, with the educational system K to 12 within uh, in uh, in Philadelphia itself. So he wrote the mandatory African American history course for the Philadelphia school district. So he's doing lots of work out in outreach as well. And there's also 
uh, uh, the Temple uh, University Center for African uh, Af Anti-Racism. Some of the work is done in the community. Lots of work in the press, the national, the, uh, the local press, and they so done a lot of work to promote a positive image about thinking about Africa and the law of Africa, being positive about it. And, and he, will, he will say some things about it, advanced, advanced. So, I like that, but it says, so what do you say about Africa? And you don't want to be defending Africans, right? Advanced, you know, Africa should be advanced. You know? The defensive part, that's not, that's not what we are about. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. And so the his talk, uh, the originality, uh, one of the originators of this concept of uh, Africanity. So he's going to talk about the philosophical, cultural, and economic basis for the African diaspora. So uh, exploring this subject and looking at ideas about migration, the histories of migration, and theories about migration and about the African peoples, both in the US and on the African continent. So thank you much. Um, I guess I can start by saying uh, what I always do, and that is to thank the people who brought me here. So thank you very much, uh, African Studies Center. I want to give thanks to uh, Professor Leo uh, Zulu, uh, to Professor uh, Awa Sa, to uh, Professor Upinyo Maje. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to, uh, uh, Professor Colombo, and to uh, a, a distinguished scholar who is here, uh, Professor Usman. He already knew who it was. Right? He said, Thank you. Sangpo, <laughs> who, uh, who has been in correspondence with me for, for quite a while, and I'm so happy to come here to see you at this uh, great university. Very delighted to be at Michigan State, and some of you, I know there are two or three people here who remember when I used to come. Seems like there's somebody I remember in the back there. Right? But I used to come here many years ago, uh, almost every every other year, every year. But I'm delighted to be back and to be in this program with you. I just want to uh, start then by simply saying that my name. You you heard the introduction. But my name, Malefi Kete Asante, was not the name that was given to me at birth. You may know that. I was born in the state of Georgia. So I was not given that name. And I sometimes, and I did explain, I think, and as I run toward Africa, by the way, I'm, I'm writing a new memoir, right? <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which will correct some of the errors in the first. <laughs> but, um, uh, my, my name, um, Malefi Kenti Asante, was given to me by uh, the Asante Haney uh, Opoku Wari II uh, in Kumasi, Ghana, uh, in 1972, when he was the Asante Haney, the, the paramount king of Asante. Uh, and he, he sort of embarrassed me, in a way, uh, by uh, asking my name, and I gave him my name, and this is not an African name. <laughs> so since it was not an African name, you need to have an African name, you know? <laughs> so that, that is that conversation. The name uh, uh, Molefi, of course, is from Suto. It's from uh, South Africa. And it was a name I gave myself in solidarity with the struggle in Southern Africa. Uh, one who always uh, returns to rebuild and to keep traditions and, and that kind of thing. So. Uh, and I give you that and say that, uh, so I have a Ghanaian last name. So when people see it, uh, if they're from East Africa, they think it means thank you in Kiswahili. Asante, it means thank you. Uh, and I tell them, no, it's a tree word. It's from Ghana. And it doesn't mean that. Uh, it means basically, uh, I told you to leave me alone, but you wouldn't. <laughs> I, have, I have to fight you. you know? <laughs> that was um, the, the expression of the people from Kumasi to the people of Denchir and Ghana, and to the historical reference. Uh, and then um, I discovered in my DNA that my uh, mother's ancestors are from Mahasi in Sudan. 
and that my father's ancestors are from Yoruba in Nigeria. So I, I, and I'm born in Georgia, and I, I'm married to Yaninga, who is born in Costa Rica, uh, of African parents. So, so I'm a real migratory African. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been many places on the continent that uh, uh, I see myself uh, as probably a a, a story um, about what I'm talking about today. Uh, my my son was the first American born in Zimbabwe, so he claims his uh, Zimbabwean identity and uh, has been back. Uh, he's a college professor as well. So really delighted uh, to have the opportunity uh, to tell you one more thing about it, and that is that I used to have a Senegalese passport, but I don't have one anymore. <laughs> but my president is out of office, so that's another story. So, okay, so this, is, this, this gives you a whole general idea about uh, myself. Um, let me start by also saying that uh, uh, you have been, at least this university uh, has been one of those universities that has at least been open to diversity. And you've opened your doors to a lot of diversity and, and that's a good thing. Uh, and I want to talk about diasporas, but all diasporas are originally African. You know that. There are no diasporas before African diasporas. <laughs> this is the fundamental uh, notion of, of diasporas in the sense that the people uh, who left the continent, who, who not only left the continent of Africa, but who left the places of their origin and went to other places, the first people to do that were Africans. And, uh, and that uh, means, therefore, that there are uh, several types of diasporas. There are those that are intracontinental, that is, where people move around in, in one continent. Um, I know that that is true, for example, even now in Africa. Uh, if you go to uh, South Africa, you will meet people who, who are from the Congo. And if you go to uh, Ghana, you meet people from Nigeria. Uh, if you go to Kenya, you meet people from Zimbabwe. So it, it, people move around and Africans have always moved. This has always been the history of uh, people on the African continent. Sometimes people think of Africa as static. I don't know why, but that's one of the things, the perceptions that, that people have, particularly in the Western world. But it's not that way at all. It's the very, active uh, continent, as you will see, uh, as I began to explain this. So there are also, as I said, these intercontinental uh, diasporas. And uh, uh, this has happened for, for millennia uh, as well. Uh, if you look back and you think of what uh, uh, Herodotus wrote in the histories, one of the things that he wrote was about the people of Colchis. And he said that the people of Colchis actually had come from Yemen, from Egypt. He said, the reason I knew it, he said, was because they got black skin and woolly hair, just like the Egyptians. This is what he says in book two of histories. He said, the people of Colchis, now, where's Colchis? Well, when you study Colchis, uh, and it's very interesting uh, to be here at Michigan State and see Russian studies is right across <laughs> to the way. And I said, wow, this is great. Because this is a whole connection here with the Circassian population. That, that whole population, uh, at least part of it, has a great history uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, army of Sinarsect, uh, who left soldiers and people uh, in that region of uh, Europe uh, many, many uh, years ago. I mean, actually, uh, BC. This was not just like a hundred years ago. This is many years ago. However, uh, Lily Golden in her book, A Long Journey Home, uh, who was the, uh, uh, the daughter of uh, African American uh, and a, uh, a white American who lived in Russia, wrote a book about her history and she has a whole section on, on these people who are still living 
uh, in this region. So it would be interesting to look at the long journey home by uh, Lily Golden. So it's very, very interesting to um, understand this notion of diaspora uh, when you understand also that the uh, earliest migration of Homo sapiens uh, anywhere was when Homo sapiens, at least from continent to continent, was when Homo sapiens left Africa 70,000 years ago and went to the rest of the world. Before 70,000 years ago, uh, everybody in the world was black. There was no other people. There was no other Homo sapiens. The only Homo sapiens were Africans. And Homo sapiens have lived in Africa for about uh, 300,000 years. I mean, we, we as Homo sapiens who in this room, uh, we're only 300,000 years old. Uh, and uh, we, we're not millions of years old, we're 300,000 years old as Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens rose first from the continent of Africa and, 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 did, and stayed on the continent of Africa at least 230,000 years before migrating out of the continent, even though there was a migration inside the continent. See, that is a science. So, once you understand that, then you begin to look at all these other uh, diasporas, and that is people leaving and going to different places, and you begin to understand that um, uh, there are a couple of things, particularly about the African uh, diaspora in, in recent times. And one of them is that we know that there was uh, what we call forced migration of Africans. I mean, this was, uh, during the whole period of the enslavement, this is what you had. You had Africans who were forced to leave uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, move to the Caribbean, uh, move to uh, uh, the Americas. Uh, sometimes people think this is uh, not you because you guys know, but so, some people think that uh, Africans left uh, the continent of Africa and only came to the United States. It's not true. Uh, the Africans are all over the Americas, and, and the largest population of Africans uh, happens in the Americas happens to be in Brazil, which is twice the number of Africans that we have in the United States. So you can't, um, uh, I mean, understand the diaspora, the African diaspora, without understanding uh, the, the, the incredible significance of Brazil. And I always tell people, you if you misunderstand that you have misunderstood a lot. There's one other aspect to that that I should add. Not just in uh, South America, but we don't even totally understand North America and the diaspora, the African diaspora, which is extremely rich in North America, including Mexico, because people don't understand Mexico either. And this is a big problem. And the, and the reason it is a problem is because Mexico defined the notion of their population after the 1940s in a sense of, of a, a sort of a, a we are mestizo. And what did, what, did the, what did the sociologists do in Mexico? They tried to obliterate the African presence as well as to obliterate the indigenous presence. How do you do that? You said, well, you're not, you're not an indigenous, you're not an, ind you're not an indigenous uh, Mexican. You're not an African. You're mestizo. We all mixed up here in Mexico. Until just three weeks ago, Mexico has now decided that they're going to enumerate the number of African people in Mexico. And that's why is that? Because of Black consciousness rising in Mexico. Why is Black consciousness rising in Mexico? Because many African Americans have gone to Mexico and they have seen Black people. And they say, where are these people in Oaxaca? Where are these people from? Well, who are these Africans out here? They said, oh, we've been here for, for years. We, we were brought, we were enslaved in Mexico. Now their consciousness is extremely clear. So you can go to Costa Chica region of Mexico and find at least 200, maybe 400 villages and towns of black people that we never, we, most people never knew existed until two things happened. One was that there was an incident at the Los Angeles City Council in this country 
in which there was racism expressed by the leader of the city council who happened to be Mexican American. And she was expressing racism against black Mexicans and black people. So the real people say, well, who is she talking about when she says the Oaxacans? What happened in Mexico was a trick. And the trick was that the Spaniards, in order to stay in power, so that's why most of the presidents of Mexico that have been, have been white people. They're Spanish. The Spanish. But they made everybody else less season. And so you don't have a sense of consciousness that now is waking up. And I was very pleased a few uh, months ago to speak at the University of Texas, El Paso, and have Mexican students come up to me and say, you're the first person that's ever talked to us about this. And it is true. We know that these, we know that we have people who are African, but it's, you're not supposed to talk about it. That's why I'm banned in Florida. <laughs> That's right. I just, I just didn't want a subject to talk about these issues. And I went to Gainesville and talked right to him. Right. I know exactly he doesn't want me to talk about this. This is what because you don't want to raise these issues. I said you don't want to, he didn't want to raise the issues in Florida. And this is just an aside, yelling up here, he said this one. Uh, <laughs> it, it, in Florida, the, the, the way uh the way Florida was peopled was Andrew Jackson took soldiers to fight against the Seminole people. And if you brought back the ears of Seminoles, you get 162 acres. That's how the white people populated Northern Florida. That's a, sto that's a real story. That's a historical reality. You can't say that in Florida because it will make the people feel guilty. There's no wrong with feeling guilty if you do something about it. That's right. It's a good Christian value. You know, people who go around, you know, it's, not, it's not an African thing, but it's, a, it is a, it's not an African religion, but it's, it's certainly a Christian religion. It's an individual way that people basically uh, self patrol. And so it's not, there's nothing wrong, but you need to know what is true. Otherwise you walk around not doing critical thinking and not, and wondering why is this the way it is? And why was that the way it was, you see? So I think that when we were brought here in, in slavery uh, from the continent of Africa, uh, one of the things that we came with we, we came with values. Most people think we didn't come with we came with. We, 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 we were empty-handed, but we came with values. And those values, I think, led to our contribution to uh, modernity. And I, 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 I like what Robert Ferris Thompson, uh, uh, Thompson, uh, uh, Robert Ferris Thompson says in his book, uh, The Flash of the Spirit, that basically the African created modernity. That without Africa, there is no modernity. So whether you take it from an economic point of view, the stock market started with the enslavement of African people. The commodity, you see, the chattel of slavery, because that's what it was. You trade in people. You decide economically risk and benefit, you see. This was a very, very central part of the economic reality of the capitalist system was the enslavement of African people, shipbuilding industry, insurance industry, to insure the commodities, you see. And all this was very, very, part, very much a part of it. But not only that, there are, I think, five areas of contribution. I'll make these quick. I think one is uh, in terms of uh, that need to be interrogated. One is the notion of continuity. The second one is I call residual colonialism. And the third, socialist uh, tendency. And the fourth is a, a nationalist tendency. And the fifth, uh, I'm calling after the book uh, that Dr. 
uh, Nadav and I wrote, which is called Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse, I'm calling the, uh, the Afrocentric tendency, uh, which is the same tendency that we see in Black Lives Matter. It's the same one, and I'll explain what that is and how that works. Quickly, continuity refers to ancestral traditions, that notion of the ancestors, uh, which is linked to uh, any kind of spirituality in, in the African world. Uh, residual colonialism, I, I refer to the, the sort of individualism that we see sometime now, uh, not just on the continent of Africa, but everywhere, which still exists, even though uh, there are moments when we say that colonization is finished. Colonization may be finished, but colonialism still exists, right? This is why we have the decolonial movement, because the decolonial movement says, wait a minute, uh, yeah, you got rid of all the people who were running this, these institutions, but these institutions st are still here, and these institutions are still the same. I was talking to uh, Professor Zulu earlier, and I was telling him, uh, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Sango, that uh, at, at, at in Cameroon, I said to them, and that, look, wait a minute. I've been all over the continent of Africa. I've been throughout all these places. I've never seen an African university. And they said, what do you mean? Well, what I've seen are Africans in universities. I've seen Africans running universities. I said, but I've never seen an African university. And what that means is basically that the institutions that were left are the institutions that are still functioning. <laughs> and people just change, you just change the people and put the same people and carry out the same thing. So that, that has to be changed. And, and, and I will come to what we need to do in terms of that. Then the, the socialist tendency is, is a tendency that uh, still is present in the African continent comes out of what I call the ethics of equality. And this, the, the people don't understand how this occurred. And I, I need to uh, just back up a minute. Even though there is on the continent, this traditional notion of communalism, which was highlighted by Zambia, particularly by Julius and the Yeri, and Kenneth uh, and Kaunda and, uh, and uh, Zambia and uh, Nayeri and Tanzania, that there is that notion. But there's also what happens on the continent of Africa, uh, is something that emerged after the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917. And after that revolution, and by, by, the, by the way, in 1917, um, 1917, George Padmore, who in my judgment, and I wrote a book about this, was the greatest promoter and propagandist for, uh, uh, for uh, socialism uh, in, the, in the African world. Well, George Padmore was 14 years old when the revolution happened in Russia. But later on, he came to study from, the, uh, from Trinidad. He came to study in the United States, in Washington, at Howard University. He spent one year at Howard and he became the greatest propagandist in the African world for the Communist Party. That was his, that's, that's what happened to George Padmore. Now, interestingly enough about George Padmore is that in the 1945 Manchester Conference that we normally say Du Bois ran, which he did run, the greatest influence in my judgment was George Padmore. Because Padmore, you remember uh, Du Bois had sent uh, Plummy and Crumah to London and he said, meet, you, you gotta meet George Padmore. Well, when Plummy and Crumah left Lincoln University in the United States and he went to London, to, he, he met George Padmore. George Padmore was the, the, the greatest, greatest propagandist of his era. I mean, he wrote every day articles and books and pamphlets about what was going on in the capitalist world and how it was against African people. When Kwame Nkrumah became president of Ghana, he recognized two diasporan Africans, George Padmore 
and W.B. Du Bois. He built a museum and a library for both of them. That's the recognition that was made by Kwame Nkrumah, his respect for the work that George Padmore, and most people forget Padmore because Padmore wasn't long in the United States, but he was, he, he lived in Germany, lived in London, lived in Russia, was uh, in the Soviet Union, was greatly involved in propagandizing Africa. And so when people say, well, most of the movements, independence movements were socialist movements. Yeah, because George Padmore made sure they were socialist. That was his intent. And that was so, so in a sense, even if we talk politically about the making of the modern world, you can't forget people like George Padmore. Let me just say one other thing. I, I mentioned um, um, Mexico earlier. The first black president in North America was not Barack Obama. The first black president in North America was Vicente Guerrero. Now, most people get, don't realize that. And, and, and if, we, if we don't realize that, here's what we don't realize. Guerrero became president of Mexico in 1829. He immediately abolished slavery in Mexico. Slavery was not abolished in America in the, North, in the United States until 1865. It was abolished in Mexico in 1829 by a black president, Vicente Guerrero. Now, what happened after 1829? White settlers from Louisiana and Arkansas went into Texas and then decided that they want to bring enslaved Africans with them to Texas and to make Texas an agricultural grand center for cotton picking. That's just, that's your, that's Stephen P. Austin. Austin, Texas is named for him. He was a big, big racist leading movement to take Texas out of Mexico. So when you read the story about, remember the Alamo? You know what the Alamo was about? Alamo didn't belong to the United States. It belonged to Mexico. That was Mexico. The white Americans went and took over the Alamo and said, no, we gonna make this America. The Mexican government says, no, we, you ain't gonna make this America. This, 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 is, this is Mexico. This is our, San Antonio belongs to Mexico. It's not, a, it's not United States of America. And out of that came the assault on the Alamo by the Mexican army that killed those 180 some Americans. And then the Americans decided to repay Mexico and basically came in, defeated Mexico and took over half of Mexico's territory. So that's how you got California. New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, it's Mexico. And then you get upset because Mexico is coming home. <laughs> Their ancestors are buried on those lands for hundreds of years, Native Americans. And now we get upset. You see what I'm saying? So that's far as creating all kinds of tensions and all kinds of uh, problems, you see? But in terms of uh, the relationship, the African diaspora, which, which is deep uh, in the sense that Haiti in uh, 1804 defeated France. This was one of the great victories uh, uh, that, that had occurred up until that time. Uh, there, had, there, there were a few other skirmishes, but the, the defeat by uh, Desalines of Napoleon's uh, general was an incredible uh, victory for Africa, but it also meant in terms of the diaspora that Haiti had to be punished. Yeah. So what did it mean? It meant even though the Haitians kicked off the plantation owners 
and kicked out slavery, they had to pay France. They're still paying France. Because America, the United States of America and England declared, okay, we, we can see that you don't want to be slaves, but you will have to pay. <laughs> and this is what forces Haiti into a position of beggar, you see? Because basically, it was the richest colony of France. It was what gave France its wealth very early on. The wealth that France used then in its colonial empire in Africa. And some people are very happy, and I'm one of them, that at least that's beginning to break even in Africa. The people are beginning to say, look, you know what? We can take care of our own money. We got gold, we take care of our own gold. Why do we have to give it to France? That's a, that's a beautiful thing, because that's freedom. That's an independent thing, because people began to blame Africa, for things that Africa is not responsible for. It's just like um, one of my friends told me in South Africa that uh, after independence, uh, because he happened to be working close to the government, after independence, uh, and, and Mandela, Mandela walked out of a, a prison and he was elected and so forth in 1994. And what happened was that people started looking at the budget and looking at the treasury. The white people that spent all the money. And you made all the ANC and made all these promises. What it's going to do to build houses for people and go to electrify the country. And they look and they say, there's money. Where's the money? The apartheid government spent it. They knew they were losing. They spent everything. Got the country in debt. And now, okay, we hand it over to you. Now you, you see what you can do with it, you see? So you, but if you don't understand history and you don't see how these things work, you don't, you misunderstand all these things. It's just like, um, we talk many times about the Berlin Conference. I don't know what time, I, I, it, what, I'll tell me where I am. <laughs> because there's so much to say, and I'm trying to say it quickly, right? You're about 40 minutes in. Okay, good, thank you very much. So the thing is that, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, situation when you start looking at history and you start trying to understand how these things are put together because many things are put together that we don't even have any understanding about. Like uh, in um, uh, the Berlin Conference in 1884 is what gave us basically the current map of Africa because 14 nations of Europe including the United States as a, uh, just as an observer and, uh, and Turkey as an observer, uh, sat down and, and divided Africa up among themselves. No, no Africans were even involved. No kings, no queens, no leaders, no, no consultants, nobody. Just 14 European nations in a conference room in Berlin in 1884, to 1885, actually, November to February, they sat down and carved up Africa. They call it the magnificent cake. Africa won't even know anything about it. We just carve it up. England takes this, France takes this, Portugal takes this, Spain takes this, Germany takes this, and King Leopold took Belgium, I mean, took Congo for himself. I'm, I, I will help Congo. So they, this is what they did. And then this, you implement by force. So you go to, go to people in Nigeria didn't know that they were in these situations. They said, okay, but you're in these situations and I'm going to by force make sure you know that you have no power here in your own country. That's the reality. So the Diaspora lies everywhere, even the modern diaspora of Africans. In England, the people who get the highest grades in school and the highest levels of education are Nigerians and Ghanaians. In, in England, today, the, 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 the people uh, who, who, and in the United States of America, is, we, we're getting the same sets of the same thing with many people from the Caribbean and, and in uh, 
from the continent, make it our highest grades. What, what is happening here? What are those values? Determination. Iwa Pele, good character, gentle character, gentle character. So you're my expression. Kuiri Rana, Shona for harmony. Working toward harmony, you see. Ozuzu, the evil concept of, yes, in proverbs, traditions, it's respect for elders. These are these deep values that are just ingrained in, in, and people don't even, we don't even realize why we do it, you see? Because these things become a part of, of, the, of, of the culture. Uh, I just want to say a few more things and then I'll be finished because there are challenges. And I just, in terms of modernity, uh, there's so much more to say, but let me just say this. The Washington Monument that you see in Washington, you know that's an African monument, right? Everybody knows that. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. It's African. Washington Monument didn't just happen. It's based on the African Tekken. And that Tekken, you can see that Tekken uh, throughout classical Africa, whether you look at it in Egypt, whether you see them in Nubia, whether you see them in, uh, in Ethiopia, it's a Tekken. That's, that's the example. The Washington Monument is, we, we call them obelisk. But at one time, the European nations, every European nation had to have one. So they were in Paris. They were in, I've seen them in Rome, in New York, London, Everybody had to, they, they took them, just literally took them, packed them up and, and took them to Istanbul, took all, took the obelisk from the Nile Valley civilization. And then when I was a student at UCLA, the curator took me down to the bottom of Haynes Hall and showed me 2,000 pieces of Yoruba art. And I said to him, sir, how did the University of California, uh, how do you get that, all that art from Nigeria? He said, missionaries, and people <laughs> came by, and gave it, sold it. And then they say, Africa has no culture. Oh, You've taken everything and you put it, I mean, when I went to the British Museum, I, I, this is a true fact. I went to the British Museum, floor, 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 floor. And I came out, I said, well, where is Britain? <laughs> no, I mean, there must be a room somewhere that has British stuff in it. Everything I saw was from all over the world, but not from Britain, you see what I mean? So we have to just see that uh, the diaspora is, is broad, it's big. Uh, the challenges of Africa are gonna be great. Population is young. The average age of African is 18. Think about that. A country like Senegal, 18. A country like Nigeria, 18. Some are maybe 19, but the average age on the continent is 18 as, composed, as, as, as compared to 49 in Europe. The average age of Europe, 49. The average age of Africa, 19 or 18. That's what's coming. That's why Nigeria will be uh, certainly soon uh, a, a massive country of an incredible population. It's probably going to be right, right up there, uh, close to India. It, it is that is growing extremely fast. The fastest growing nation in the world is not Nigeria, though. It is Niger. Niger. The average woman has nine children. Niger. Look it up, statistics. This is our, you, it's an incredible thing. So you say you yourself, these are the these are the coming challenges for the world in terms of what is going on, and so we have to uh, look at also a couple of other things. I mean, I don't, I, maybe I'll talk about them later on today. We got we got the Chinese phenomenon throughout the African continent that's going to be coming up, and then we have to also 
uh, recognize that in Liberia right now, they have just established a center for migration and diasporas. And that is a new thing, and it's a new wave in Africa that people are beginning to think about migration uh, intracontinentally as well as intercontinentally. So I'm going to stop here, and then if there are questions, we can take them. Thank you very much, Professor. I, I was, I was, yeah, you, you, you can go ahead. We're going to let people in the room ask questions first before we give people online the chance to ask questions. So you go ahead, Leo. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much. So we're taking questions now. Uh, uh, Titus, uh, thank you. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for the inspirational and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I feel like my, my mind and my heart are even up in, uh, in new dimensions. Uh, you made a reference to the point that when you are looking at uh, African universities, mm -hmm. you saw Africans in universities, but not African universities. So that got me thinking about the educational system and the role of uh, education and education institutions in addressing some of the issues that you just uh, brought up in terms of the history and the implications of the history for all the various aspects of life. Uh, the George Floyd uh, event really raised a lot of questions and opened a lot of eyes. And one of the things that some of us did in response to that is to look at a discipline. I'm an economist. So uh, eight of us got together around the country and we asked the question, how does systemic racism uh, reflected or how is it embedded in our theories, yes. economic theories yes. and the methods for the kind of research that we do? And we identify some areas where that was the case. Uh, the paper just got accepted, mm -hmm. but uh, the uh, resource for the future, the Washington uh, think tank thought, this is really interesting. So they did a blog on it mm -hmm. and they're doing podcasts on it too. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because I know that it's not just in economics where we have some foundational theories that were developed by people who have uh, uh, the mindset that would describe as racist now. They're very good. There are many policies that were informed by research that many of us do that were informed, uh, uh, that are really uh, based on racist and in, uh, unequal ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that from your perspective, what role do you see uh, education and really digging into the way we think and the way we teach uh, as a way of addressing some of the issues. Of Thank you very much. It's a very wonderful comment and I appreciate it very much because it speaks to the heart of what uh, I didn't get a chance to say regarding the book, uh, Being Human Being, uh, Transforming uh, the Race Discourse. That the, the race discourse, uh, and, and we were all, all part, <laughs> You all played a part in it, a role in it. At least I played a role in it, I confess. Uh, I played a role in it. Uh, and it started with Du Bois. Uh, he played a role in it um, with the idea that the 20th century was going to be the problem of the color line. That was a real problem. Uh, but what we have lately come to was basically what you've come to, and that is to realize that. Uh, there is almost endemic within the society uh, a, a notion of what I call a racial ladder. And, and that racial ladder is based to a large degree on some of the ideas that were created in Europe in the 15th and 16th century, and where you had, of course, this notion of racial hierarchy, uh, where you had the whites at the top, Nordics, Aryans, and so on. And then you went down from that to the Mediterranean whites and, and, and so on, down to the Africans at the bottom. That's an image that is carried around in the heads of almost everybody in the West. 
I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, uh, so, so that if you're a theorist and you're an economist, or if you are in uh, sociology or uh, psychology, it, that is also in your head. If you're a policeman, that's in your head. The racial hierarchy is there. That's the George Floyd phenomenon. But it's not just the George Floyd, it's just the reason. It's, it's Ralph Yarning's situation, you see? Because it's in the head. It, it's, it, it's an illusion, but it's in the head, right? And so because it's an illusion, when people theorize, when they sit down to write, they, it's almost like the whole process has been the process of the last 50 years. When I went to college, university, the first thing we said, to be honest with you, right? First thing we said, they don't serve grits in the cafeteria. <laughs> I'm from the South, you know what I'm saying? Where, where, where are the grits here in this? So obviously the first thing that hit us was, this institution is not made for us. It, do, it does not work for us. The second thing hit us was all the people we studied were dead white men. If we were in psychology, we didn't study nothing. There were no, there had never been a black or an Asian or anybody else but white people. We did the same thing in political science. We said, wait a minute. Where are the, this is, this is something wrong with this. But we asked the question. The professor didn't ask the question. The professor thought they were doing the right thing. They didn't raise the question and say, you know what? I'm teaching the courses about the medieval period, but I don't know anything about African medieval period, so I need to find something out about it. They didn't ask that kind of question. We students asked the question. That's why we started the Black Studies Movement. We said, oh no, there's something else here. We didn't know what it was. We knew that it didn't feel right, you see? So here's what I'm saying to you. So the book that we wrote, Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse, said that the issue is that when we start dealing with race, which is not a scientific biological term, you get confused so that you can't even explain why four black policemen would shoot a black man right. yes, in Memphis. You can't explain if you're doing the race paradigm. Because you say race shouldn't, shouldn't be. You can't explain Clarence Thomas. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you use the race paradigm, this is what I'm saying, that being human being, but I always tell people, when a student comes to my office, I see a human being. That's what, now of course, yeah, you know, I can describe that the person is white or black or I can describe, but that, but the thing is that to get rid of this racial ladder, why don't you just see people as human beings? You transform the race discourse. You, you make, you make things, then things make sense. Then you can see how bad black people can be. Who are the black people? You see, otherwise you get you, you get confused. You say, well, I just don't understand why she did that. I don't understand why he did that. I know why because the culture is bad, the values are bad. That's why they did it. Bad values, bad training, no who uh, you're you know, no, nothing like that. Right? Sorry, I thought question, yeah, right there in the back. Thank you. And then we'll move online to take some questions. How are you doing? Um, I'm right. thankful for your talk today. Um, I've also had the opportunity to hear from MK or something. Oh, that's my son. Yeah. He's more popular. Than me. I'll tell him that. He'll like that. I'll call him afterwards. <laughs> um, but I have a question about, like, do you have any dreams about, like, what's possible between, like, you? and across the diaspora in terms of like transnational- Yeah, it's already happening. I mean, I, I thank you so much for raising that question. It, look, the whole music revolution is happening right now between Africans in the Caribbean, on the continent, different countries. And one of the things, and my son is engaged and involved with, with all of that, you know, the, the, the music that's coming out of, uh, out of Accra and uh, and Kinshasa and you know it, everything is just everything is everywhere. 
African people in the diaspora are communicating through their music. And it's every, it's, 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 it's going to be a whole new, new world. And I see that happening. And I feel it happening. Wherever you go, you see it, you know? And people are looking at the videos and listening to the music. Okay. Uh, okay, let's let's take two questions in the room and then we'll, we'll switch on to ours and she will handle the online questions. So, uh, uh, Philip in the back and then Jonathan. Thank you. My name is Philip. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. Presentation. There's, uh, a phenomenon in history that I thought was in the past, but I think it's still ongoing. And that's this phenomenon where, even though you've had great Western scholars you know, contribute to African history, there are those who come in and generally try to dispute the history. And we are constantly battling people claiming that, oh, Zimbabwe was never built by people in Zimbabwe. Uh, the Malian universities were not never built by the Africans. Mm -hmm. The city states along the East Coast were never built by mm -hmm. Africans. And then recently, there's this professor at the University of Maryland, and he's been on a mission to prove that Allah that Ibrahim never wrote um, <laughs> out of Africa, uh, which was one of the first by uh, uh, yes, uh, but he was the writer. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering. And he's, he's being given space, even on the media, in the media. And I'm wondering what our response should be. Uh, should we just ignore? Or just yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that question, but you guys are really on top of all these things. That's a very good question. And it, it, and it bothers me, but um, because I've seen it too. I, I, there's an experience in my hometown, Valdosta, Georgia, where um, and, 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 and I think it was 1917, where a black woman was killed and her she was pregnant, her stomach was ripped open uh, and the fetus was thrown on the ground and stomped to death. And then they built a, they built a, they have, there's a historical legend to her, Mary Turner, uh, to her. And I went by to see it, and every time I go by to see it, it's been shot up, but, but you know, somebody who's done a shot, shoot it up. And you, you, uh, uh, so, so there's now somebody who's trying to write that what happened didn't happen. In other words, she wasn't the baby, she wasn't pregnant, she didn't have this. Now, interestingly enough, my, uh, uh, I have nieces uh, who, who are the great, great granddaughter, daughters of this woman who was killed. So, so, but there's a guy I met whose ambition is to say that she wasn't killed the way she was killed. So, 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 so the way the record says, and the record was given first by Walter White, who was the, director, the leader of the NAACP, when he went to visit it, visit the case years ago. I'm mentioning that quickly to say to you what Sheikh Abdul Joe said to me. <laughs> I said to Sheikh Abdul Jok, the greatest African intellectual of the 20th century. I went to Senegal to see him in uh, 19, it must have been 82, 83. Uh, he passed away, I think, in 86. But I went, I went to see him. And I, I went to his office and I said to him, uh, Professor Jok, uh, I really want to be like you. I, I want to defend Africa. And he said to me, Africa needs no defense. He said, this is what I say to you, uh, Professor F.E.O. You must advance. Let your enemies fight. You must advance. The, 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 the truth will always win. They, they cannot disprove Zimbabwe. Yeah, I, 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 there's no way they can be disproved. And why would they want to disprove it, except they have this racial ladder in their mind that Africans did not build the pyramids? Like, who built them? There are only Africans there. Who built them? You tell me who built them. The further back you go in Egypt, the blanker the people are. Who built the pyramids? Not the Arabs. There were no Arabs there then. There were no Europeans. 
Europe, you, Egypt is not in Europe. Egypt is in Africa, right next to the country where my, my, my mother's family is traced to, Sudan. They're the blackest people in Africa. But what, what are you talking about? There's a, it's, a it's, it's total misunderstanding of history, total ignorance, and it's uh, you advance. Yeah, we'll take, thank you. We'll take Jonathan and then we're moving on online. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Asante, uh, thank you. Thank you, Asante. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Asante. Thank you. My question is very secret. Apart from colonialism, one of the ways Africans have been influenced by the external world is through Christianity and Islam. What are your views? My views, he said, uh, he said uh, if you can not hear him, he said, uh, Africa is influenced by Islam and Christianity. And I, my view, you, if you've read my work, you know my view. I haven't read it. Oh, <laughs> Ali Masroy, who was a friend of mine, was one of the great uh, champions of politics in Africa and, one, and was a great Muslim. And, uh, and I used to say to him, uh, because he had the theory that Africa has three traditions, Islam, Christianity, and Africa. I said, no, it has one tradition and two intrusions. <laughs> Christianity and Islam, both are intrusions. That's what I say. But can I change people if they're Christian? Can I change them if they're Muslim? No, I'm not about that. I can't do that. They, they, they must do that themselves. But I'm an African. My, my, my religion is African. My belief is African. My lifestyle is African. I love African values, Maat, Oz Ozuzu, Kuririrana, Iwapeli, good character. Good character, that's the best. Better, good character is better than love. That's a Christian value, love? No, African value, you are by value. Iwarere Irapele, good character. You don't know people by their titles. You know them by their character. Yeah, I want uh, online questions, please. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about values, values that you're talking about. So somebody asked, uh, isn't it just nostalgic to talk about these values? Like how come? Maybe Africa is in the state that it is if we have or had those values. So if you can come comment on that. And yes. yeah, so that's. Yeah, well, I, the first I, that, I, that question, the, 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 the reason Africa is in the state that it's in, in terms of values, if we talk about why, like there's chaos or there's conflict that's going on or uh, it is because of the intrusion, in my judgment, of many of the other values that are not African. That's why. Take, take for example, I mean, this is a good opportunity to tell you about this. Right now, there's a, there's a, there's a conflict going on in Sudan, right? There's a, a, a conflict going on by uh, the guy who is supposed to be the head of the government, Burhan, and, and the guy who's his deputy, uh, Hamada. They're fighting. Their armies are fighting each other. But, but that's not a, it's not an African battle. Both of these people are fighting a battle against the majority of the people in Sudan. 85% of the Sudanese are African people. 15% of the people rule them. They are of Arab background in their minds. I say in their minds. <laughs> because they look just like other Africans. <laughs> but these 15% these are now fighting among themselves. These two, these two generals who are fighting, Hamadi and Burhan, they, they, both, uh, uh, Hamadi led the Jangaweed, and the Jangaweed were the people who killed the Darfurians. And it's not, that was not even religious. The Darfurian people were Muslims. They killed them because the Darfurians refused to be Arabs. Not because they were not Muslim, they were Muslim. But they say, I speak my own language. I speak my grandmother's language. I eat my grandmother's food. 
I named my children after my great grandfather and great grandmother. And the Arab government said, you can't do that. You have to name, you get to have Arab names. Now those people are fighting among themselves. That's what's going on in Sudan. So, so yeah, it's not African values. Not, not the way I think of African values. Next question. So we have also questions about uh, the challenges. So the, what are ways that uh, these type challenges can be confronted? For instance, the university, how can we uh, have African universities that are African? And yes. also here in the US, what's a way given what's happening in some universities where people are fighting to ban books about African American history. So if you have any, what, what's your take on those? those Thank points? you very much for that question. Here's the thing. In the United States, uh, we also have a problem. And our, our problem is, uh, I, I take the historically black colleges and universities, there are about a hundred of them. Not one of them that I've seen has an Afrocentric curriculum orientation. That's, I want to say that so that won't, people just won't say he's talk, talking about the ones on the continent. No, the ones, that, the historical black colleges, I don't know one that uh, I could say that stands up for African culture or African history. And, and most of them do not even have African studies programs. That's the historically black colleges. And the reason they don't have it is because they inherited their curriculum from the white university professors who started them. They, the, that, that's what, and the boards, and many of the boards are still predominantly white. So that's a problem for the historically black colleges and universities in the United States, right? So you just have to tell the truth. So in the African continent, here's how we can deal with it. We need to have courageous leadership. And we have had it in the, uh, we had it, and I think we still have it. The, the, to me, the most possible place is South Africa. Because I saw it at UNISA under the previous vice chancellor. Uh, because uh, Makango was, was extremely focused on saying to his faculty, before you interrogate Europe or Asia, please interrogate Africa. If you are going to teach in agriculture, tell us what we have done in agriculture. What, what has it, if you're going to teach political science, what have been the polities of the African continent itself? What have Africans, don't just go to Plato. Don't, what are the, what are the African sages saying? Raise that question first. And then go forward. You see what I'm saying? If you're going to go to literature, go to the classic literature of ancient Kemet, Egypt. Start with that. If you're going to do science and medicine, if you're going to do geometry, the, the first geometry had to be African. Well, well, who, where, where else could it have come from? It came from the overflow of the Nile River and the measuring out of land to give people the same amount of land they had before the floods. It came from building the pyramids. It's the origin of measurement of the earth. Let's start right. If we start right, we realize we would like to the end right, but, but you've got to start right. And we haven't started right on the African continent in our schools. Not when I go to a university and I find that there are no books that even honor the African scholars who have contributed so much to even contemporary life. You go to the university and you say, well, where's the book by, by Mafeji? Oh, no, 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 no. By Samkangi. Where, where are these writers? And then, of course, when you start thinking about, of course, we got the three great ones. You always see Soyinka, Achebe, and Ngugi. But hey, wait a minute. There's, there's so many other 
right? You, why? Why they're not the basis for education in Africa? I can't understand. But I do understand that if you had, if you, well, they wouldn't have me as a person to leave this institution because I would change the whole thing. But you get, you got to change the whole thing. You got to have you you have to you have to interrogate everything. You cannot receive it as it is. And that's what happened to me. I mean, that's what happened to me very early. And I and I do confess that uh, being able to be a full professor at 30 years of age gave me freedom that I would not have had had I had to work my way like many other professors. That was his, that was the thing. That gave me freedom to say, I don't like this. I don't go for this. This is not correct. We got to change this. And but you know, it, you know. The whole career thing is very tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a follow-up question that uh, that relates to education. Yes. So um, right now, um, for I just wonder if there's any organized um, response, even by the um, intelligentsia, however defined in the mm -hmm. African community or African American mm -hmm. diaspora, however defined to. Address the issue that seems to be quite scary to me that um, children being educated in certain parts of this country cannot actually know the truth about their history. And that somehow you have this erasure of um, Black history, Black reality in favor of something that will be inconsistent with their experience once they're out of, they're, they're, they're out of high school. Different. And so what is the response? There, 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 there are many responses. People are making responses. Some are making individual responses. Uh, some are uh, uh, starting now to create freedom schools, uh, to have Saturday schools for children. Uh, because if you don't, uh, particularly because education is so local in the United States, it's very difficult with the school boards and that kind of thing to, to really get uh, uh, the kind of education is proper. So people are doing Saturday schools. You know, they're having schools for children where they're teaching history and culture and so forth. So that's being developed. We, we had that in the 60s and now it's coming back. And I think it's useful to come back. We, we used to have, have more of that and then it went away for a while. But I think it's, it, it's always been a need for it, yes. Dr. Dr. I just wanted to thank you again for your presentation. Thank I just you. wanted to add a little context to that. I don't want to sure. um, say like I'm an expert. So I'm in the College of Education, so my background is curriculum instruction. For those who may not have been raised and gone to school in the United States, one of the biggest conversations and the arguments that we're having regarding CRT, when you're talking about CRT in the classroom, there is no standardized social studies curriculum. Mm -hmm. So what that means is mm -hmm. you actually have 50 states, That's right. and those 50 states aren't necessarily teaching and using the same textbook. So right. when you see someone like Clarence Thomas or whatever right. that, that said something crazy, or that one right. guy who said, you know, um, Blacks came to the United States as immigrants, <laughs> that's actually what their book said. That's right. That's true. And so when you're having right. conversations, you so told me, know your history. That's true. They didn't read the same text. Yeah, that's exactly. So I think for those in, who may not be from the US, I just want to give a little context. That's part of the controversy is when people are arguing and no one's arguing from the same book. So for example, um, there are states that actually say that uh, folks came to the United States as immigrants. Um, there's only, I think, five states that actually mention the word slavery, mm -hmm. and then there's the majority of the curriculum actually doesn't mention slavery right. as being responsible for the civil war. Right. But right. So all That's these right. conversations that just that That's right. is based on there's no one common book of social studies of history of what happened. And That's so right. we're running into conversations where people are arguing because we weren't there. Well, I read the book, didn't read history, and then we're dealing with family background. Mm -hmm. Well, my grandfather was like, he was the best slave because he gave the slaves Sunday off. <laughs> but in his family, he, right? So we're arguing things because we don't have the same story. Absolutely. Very, very good. Excellent. Yes, sir. 
So thank you so much. Thank you. you. You and I talked a little bit. Yes. And I would love to know how we would fund the African university you have in mind. I might have the same African university in mind. How do we fund it? I'm also thinking about how we deal with the credentialing system. Mm -hmm. Because I would love to hear in that African university, people who don't have PhDs mm -hmm. and masters and mm -hmm. degrees to come teach because mm -hmm. they have knowledge mm -hmm. that is very important mm -hmm. to pass mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How do we fund those things? How do we fund it? We have to fund it ourselves. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very big believer that, uh, that we should not, that Africans, uh, particularly in the diaspora and in the uh, in the continent of this age, we cannot be beggars. And we, it's, that time is finished. And uh, that we are, uh, our nobility is such that uh, through determination and through uh, hard work, we can achieve it. I mean, remember, Marcus Garvey built the largest organization that we have ever seen among African people during a period when they didn't have internet. And uh, he, he, he had, they say, up to uh, 5 million people in his organization. And he built it word of mouth and just uh, passionate, emotional uh, conversation. And people joined and paid their dollar. So I, I think we can do it, but we just have to be committed to it and devoted to it. And then there will be people who do have money who will support it. But I think it has to, we have to see what it could be. But it's a good question, very good question. We can start in Mount Pleasant. When you just, <laughs> <laughs> you just introduce yourself so okay. <laughs> I know who you are. Okay, I'm Isaac Alum from the African yeah. Studies Center. Yeah. And I think Pupeyu's point is really about uh, what we as, unfortunately, this kind of knowledge and this kind of thinking yeah. about uh, rehabilitating mm -hmm. the African memory mm -hmm. and teaching children about who they really are. Yes, it's, yes. It seems to be lodged right now into the progressive, forward-looking mm -hmm. Africanist scholar, mm -hmm. African scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it is not in the politician mm -hmm. which right. who, who right. control the kitty. Right? Right. So, so, so his question, I think, you know, really puts the onus on us as intellectual leaders of Africa to create collaborations with the political movements and with the political uh, community and with the business community, the African business community, those who have done well. Yes. Uh, and to, to really highlight the significance of this because it's not as if it's just um, a kind of an affirmative action we're right. talking about. Right. We're talking about survival sure. of the country. Sure. Sure. And, and we have to speak in those terms to, to capital, to African I think so. And to, to African politicians and show the urgency. Well, I agree with that. And I think that that's the answer. We've got to talk to the politicians, but we've got to talk to the, to the people who have the capital yes. as well. And we can do it. We can be done. And Zimbabwe will be a good place to start to, to do that. So thank can, you so much. Yeah, so we'll take one more question online and then we can chat with uh, okay. Professor Santo, who will switch next door where the lunch is being served. So we can continue our conversations. One more question. Our... Okay, so this question is about what are ways to bring the African diaspora together? And maybe a comment on the saying that there were Africans in America before Christopher Columbus. Wow, those are both big questions. The, 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 to, to, to bring uh, the diaspora together, uh, unity has to be preceded by consciousness. So you can't really bring the diaspora together unless people are on the same page. You know, they gotta have the same kind of consciousness. And then, then you can, because, because I, I always tell people, I never have any problems anywhere in the world where I go, I see black people, I don't have any problems. I mean, wherever I am. I mean, in Russia, I was in Russia in 2019 speaking at the Institute of African Studies. And what, what did I find? A whole community of Black students at the university, uh, you know, who just came and just took me. I mean, it was just, and they were from all over the continent. By the way, Michigan State has great diversity. The Rudin University in, uh, in Moscow, 
they make a habit of having one African from every country in Africa. I have never seen that before. One from, you know, from Namibia, you know, from Swaziland. They go and get one from every country. It's a very interesting procedure. But no, but I think that we could do it with consciousness. That's what. On the question of, uh, of the presence of the Africans in, in the Americas, I, I, I think that we do know about the Mali expedition. We know about the 1311, 1312 expedition when uh, 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 Abu Bakaka, uh, 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 you know, sent a thousand fishing boats across the Atlantic and then another thousand and so on. We, we know that. And we know that one came back and reported that the others kept going, but that uh, they were in a current in the ocean that took, took them faster than his boat would go. Uh, and we know that there's a great uh, seafaring tradition uh, uh, on, the, on the west coast of, uh, of Africa. And you still see this in Senegal and in Ghana, where these uh, uh, people go out to sea in these long fishing boats and stay for days. So this is a whole tradition. And we do know that in 1488, Columbus stops in, um, in Ghana, in Elmina. He stops in Elmina, uh, Elmina uh, before he uh, in, uh, 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 came this way in, 18, in, uh, in 1492. We know he went, was in Ghana. That, that's a historical record. Uh, we also know that um, there, there are evidences that suggest that uh, uh, African people came uh, to uh, the Americas uh, before Leo Weena. Uh, who wrote a book in the 1920s called uh, Africa in the Americas. I mean, you can look up these books, Leo Weiner's book. You can look up Ivan Van Sertima's book. They came before Columbus. Um, they're, 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 yeah, there's, but this is all, to me, it's all logical. I mean, you, you put something in the, old, you, know where, you know where the hurricanes come from, right? The hurricane, well, you know, we have these big hurricanes in, in North America in September. In October and November, we you all know about that, right? The hurricanes, the East Coast, the ones that hit the East Coast, they come from Africa. It's a, it's a carnival. They, they come from, they, they, they don't start in Africa, but off the shore of Senegal, you just put stuff in the water, it comes right to Florida. <laughs> it's just, that's just science. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much, thank Professor Said. Uh, this is an honor, and an excellent presentation. Thought provoking. We'll, we'll be pondering over these thoughts as we go, and and so and we we'll, would like to thank all those that were able to join us online. And so we'll close that part of our uh, of our talk now. And for the people that are in the room, uh, we'll just move in next door. Uh, it just uh, it's the next room, so just next door. Lunch is being served. So we continue this discussion at a more leisurely pace at four o'clock. So we meet here for the 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 black faculty uh, and start uh, the black faculty. Yes staff and administrators association team together with African studies. So we wanted to have a, a, a more a discussion about uh, the diaspora and modernity at a more leisurely pace in the, in the form of a panel. So we continue our discussion between four and 5.30 right here. Just come back here if you want to join in and we can continue this discussion. Thank you very much all for coming and please make sure you join us.